I'm about to tell you why everything you love about opera is personally and violently rage-inducing to me. Specifically, there are five traditions that opera has hung on to that just make me want to let it die. Like here, right? Just like right now, where it is. And there's a good chance that one of them is something you love. Start warming up those fingers. Here are my unpopular opinions about opera traditions you love and I hate. This is operatic Scientology. What kind of power trip is this? I'll calm down. You can calm down. I mean, look at this. It just, it looks like a budget crisis. So here's the thing. Classical music is in this weird niche. It's not cool to like it. So the people who do like it are in this weird position of being really afraid to talk smack about it. You know what I mean? because like they don't want to scare people off. I truly love opera and just like classical music in general, but I feel like as scary as it sounds, leaning into those things that make it imperfect might actually be the thing that opera needs to make itself relevant again. Because perfection's not relatable. You know what is? Opera. So I'm not here to express judgments on opera, just like in general, I mean, that, that actually is what I'm here to be doing, but it comes from a place of love, is like what I'm saying. Art doesn't survive for centuries on accident. There must be something that has kept opera alive. Some of the traditions must be good. However, when those traditions stop serving the audience and they start being about, you know, like tradition for the sake of tradition, and also I hate them, then I think I can tell you about them. If you're new here, hey, I'm Kate. If you're not, hi, welcome back. Thanks for coming back. Uh, let's go judge. All right, tradition number one that enrages me. Oh God, guys, I, I am about to break some opera loving hearts here. I warned you, opera tradition one that I have hated since I was 15, the languages. So many things. Not singing in the language the audience speaks. Why has this become a thing? I don't, I don't understand. Like literally, I don't understand this whole tradition. I like, it's it's not worth it. I know it's not worth it. Whole casts and conductors and audience members that are all sitting there for three and a half hours listening to this language that not one single person speaks. And so you're just looking up at the super titles for like three and a half hours. It's exhausting. It's exhausting because you're trying to engage with like this plot and music that might not be the easiest thing to listen to. If you disagree, that's what that's for. You can tell me I'm wrong. I'm not, but you probably live in a free country. So exhausting, so exhausting to process for three and a half hours. But let's say this isn't a thing, right? Like let's say everyone in the audience has got this like mojo jojo brain situation going on and it's not a problem to have to like look up and down. Fine, awesome, okay, excellent. Unless you have a full libretto under your face, you still can't understand anything. Like, you know what I mean? It's all just, ah. Like, I cannot sit here and honestly tell you that that was five different vowels. This is not personal. I learned it. Like, it's something that I still do. It's a technique. I get it. But I just, I think, I think we've gone too far. Like, right? Why don't we just put our energy into learning a technique where audiences can actually just understand you? I wish we knew how to compromise. This drives me nuts. Like, none of us like to spend y literal years of our lives learning how to speak all these languages and then go to the country where the people actually do speak the language and being told that they can't understand us. This is operatic Scientology. I don't understand how we're still teaching this non-diction to singers. Oh my God. On that subject, let's talk about this. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have gone to one of my teachers and asked, how can we pronounce things differently when we sing that are different from the way that native speakers say the word? You know what their answer was? It's just the way we do things. Who, who is this serving? What kind of like black mirror sort of world are we living in where we go on stage and purposefully sing in a way that neither natives nor non-natives can understand us. I just assume that the people who came up with these rules have never had a conversation. Like I can only assume that they are not 
familiar with talking. And this is not a problem exclusive to opera. I'm looking at you, pop singers, anytime after 2018. I can't understand what you're saying. Uh-uh. I don't, I don't want to see the album. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to like go on genius lyrics and use brain capacity to like read while I'm trying to listen and enjoy? No, no. This is the thing, guys. You have to get it. Like, that's all I want opera productions to do. Just help me understand you. Like, it's beautiful. I'm with you. But I also have to follow a plot, right? And like, sometimes understand the words. Okay, enraged. My suggestion on how to fix this, sing in the language of your audience. If you lose some nuance in the translation, I can promise you it's not more nuanced than you're losing when you've got people giving themselves small concussions sitting in their chairs. And for pronunciation stuff, like, I get it, right? I know why we mess those up. It's to, you know, keep the vowels aligned and make sure we've got the space correctly oriented so that we can project our voices. Like, I get it. It's part of the technique. I'm just saying, maybe that if a French person says regardez, we don't then sing regarda, you know? I personally now try to find non-opera singers who do speak the language I'm trying to sing in to make sure that they can understand me when I'm gonna go on stage. And if they can't, guess what? That's on me. It's my job to give them every chance in the world to appreciate what I'm trying to communicate to them, right? Because then, if, if they don't like it after that, all I have to blame is myself and that's okay. They just don't like me. I can handle that. So let's stop, opera. Let's stop using language as an excuse and just embrace rejection. Like if we're gonna get rejected now, let's do it and save ourselves some financial crises down the line. It's not easy, I know, but I care about you. So I hope you trust me. I just want you to stop being so misunderstood, literally. Opera tradition number two that drives me crazy is changing the setting. Like taking a show that's set in a specific time and place and then changing it for absolutely no reason. I'm talking about like going to see Hansel and Gretel and the director says, I don't want this gingerbread house. You know what audiences really want? Dinosaurs in space. This makes as much sense to me as Harry Potter being on a submarine or like Gilmore Girls in a volcano. You know, like why? Like nowhere else in content are people just ignoring a setting. And like everyone's just okay with it. It's the wildest thing to me. Like why stop there? Why not just ignore the plot altogether? Why not just like throw out the music? Guys, this is such a popular thing to do in opera that I swear if I went to go see a production and it was actually set in the time and place in which it was written, I would be astonished and I hate it. Am I the only one? Why do we do this? I mean, I can like kind of empathize with how this came to be, right? Operas are new when they're written, so it's it's still interesting, but then it gets to be like 50 years later and so you're getting tired of stuff. So like maybe you switch up a costume here or like, I don't know, a decade there. And then, you know, you get a hundred years down the line and you've got Lion King in China. Like I get how it happens. You're trying to keep it fresh and new every night. But you know what else is fresh and new every night? The audience. Call me crazy, but I kind of feel like performances should be for the people who are watching, not the people on stage. I don't blame people for experimenting. I support that innovation is necessary to keep art relevant. Rules are there to be broken, sure. But some rules are in place for a reason. Like they've, they've stood the test of time. Things like storytelling, things like marketing, letting audiences know what they're paying for before they actually show up. But now all of a sudden we're just like, well, no, yeah, like I paid for Bohemian Paris, but they gave me Wall Street instead. And I just thought that was brilliant. Putting a, a totally different setting on top of a, of a totally different plot. I don't, I don't get it. I don't like it. And again, this is just me. This is just my opinion, right? Like I don't make the rules. I wish I did, but I don't make the rules. I just judge them. If you're looking at Romeo and Juliet one day and you think to yourself, you know what this needs? Superheroes. Take a step back. Just, you know, put on some lo-fi, make some tea, go for a walk. We, everyone has crazy thoughts. It doesn't mean that you have to charge people to see yours. There are other ways, is what I'm saying. There are other ways to keep performances fresh. Broadway has figured it out, you know? Like, it doesn't have to be this way. It shouldn't be this way. Let's stop 
putting Mozart in the chocolate factory. It just doesn't have to be this way. Oh no, this one sucks too. And this tradition isn't just opera. This is just like classical music in general. This goes so far back, I don't even know who started it. And we are all such buttheads about it. This tradition of not making any noise during a production. Like not being allowed to be human. Not being allowed to like be musicking with the people on stage and instead we're trying to reproduce this like recording studio level of silence except live and surrounded by hundreds of other humans. If you want silence, I propose that that's what your living room is for. Like we have recordings now. You can listen to performances in absolute silence. And this is the kind of like unrealistic live experience expectation that we have that is so expensive for so little reward. Somewhere along the way, we all collectively decided that classical music goes into the same category as like meditation or church. Like it can only be enjoyed in like silent contemplation of your religious soul. Why? Like look, this is a standard night at the opera in the 19th century. It's not quiet. People are like talking and clapping and like being humans in a space with other humans, you know, enjoying the thing on stage together. I mean, like how could Bridgerton have had any plot at all if people were not allowed to talk in opera theaters? I ask you. But now you're not even allowed back into the theater if you left to go to the bathroom because the door might squeak on the way in. What is that? Listen, granted I'm a volatile person and like my emotions go from nothing to like erupting volcano really quickly, but this pisses me off. Pun very much intended. So here's what I wanna say to the classical community. When we have concerts, let's stop pretending that we're not all humans with needs and emotions. I think so much pressure could be taken off of both the audience and the performers if we just like, just relaxed, like just a little. Doesn't it sound nice to go out and just enjoy music with your friends? To be able to like go in and out whenever you want to, to be able to clap and cheer if you are moved? Doesn't that sound more fun? For everyone? Isn't that what live performance is about? Like being there with other people together? Why do we treat live performance like it's this exact replica of a recording? I don't get it. I mean, there can be some of that, sure. Like even in rock concerts, they have moments where there's like, you know, people pulling out lighters and having some, some lovely silent time with the people around them. But the whole concert, every night, for a hundred years? Hmm, mm-mm. I miss the interaction with other people. I don't like feeling like there's a spotlight on me every time I shift in my seat and my like clothes make noise because then I'm not enjoying the music anyways. I've just dropped a ton of money to worry about the fact that I'm ruining my neighbor's experience. Oh, and the big version of this, not clapping between certain movements. What is that about? Who made this rule? And why do we all just go with it? Literally, people will shush you if you clap at the wrong time in a classical performance. Like, like it's embarrassing to enjoy something. Like, oh, oh, you're not supposed to be clapping right now. Why? Why? Like, what kind of power trip is this? Look at me. Sometimes we don't have to shush other people's enjoyment and everything's gonna be okay if they're just over there enjoying themselves. Okay. And I'll admit it, I do this too. Like I totally get that herd mentality. You don't wanna be the one standing out making noise when no one else is making noise, drawing attention to yourself. It's not fun. But all my non-classical friends get really annoyed when I tell them this and I try and save them from that embarrassment before it happens, you know? And like, they're right. They're totally right. So much silence in a concert hall that we can't even like, scratch an itch without somebody turning around and like giving you an evil eye. Is that, is that more fun? I, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. It's so quiet that you're not allowed to get up and go to the bathroom. Like I'm, I'm not about it. One, it's just physically uncomfortable. And two, all of your effort goes into like enjoying the performance the right way instead of just enjoying the performance. And this is the kind of stuff we're doing that makes live performances less fun for ourselves. It's not 
necessary. We have spent years literally silencing our audiences into the grave. We've made that mistake already. We don't have to keep making it. I would love for us to benefit from what every other genre seems to have learned. I'm ranting, it's time to move on. But if you do like this kind of like ranting about classical music stuff, then don't forget to like and subscribe. I talk about uh, classical music and my experiences in the industry as a professional musician. It's all basically stuff that I think is nuts or like really beautiful or completely infuriating. Opera tradition number four that I think is ridiculous, no food or drinks, mostly the drinks. What is that? And to be clear, I'm not saying that there's nothing at opera houses, right? I'm just saying you can't bring it into the theater. You have to like pound your wine outside in the 15 minute intermission while you're standing in line to pee because you can't go during the performance and then come back in. I've been in theaters where I wasn't even allowed to bring in a bottle of water. What is the point? Like name one other entertainment venue where you're not allowed to have something in the theater. What's up? Opera. Like this was never an issue until the middle of the 1800s. And then somehow we went from like playing poker and drinking wine during performances to just sitting in our little seats like, like the good little Puritans we are. And I wanna know why. I just want some wine and why. Like I can't stop thinking about any non-classical concert or like a club or like any other evening entertainment for adults where they wouldn't serve some kind of food and or drink. They'd never open. And it's not like classical music people don't drink. I know for a fact that's not true. Like half the audience will stay afterwards and clear out the bar. And I thought, well, maybe, okay, it's because the theaters don't want people to come in and just like spill stuff on the floor. It's hard to clean up and it gets kind of sticky and gross. And like, I can get on board with that. I like to have clean things, but then they have galas or stand-up comedy shows that are in these exact same theaters and people are going to their seats with glasses of wine. So like, that's clearly not it. So what's the deal, opera? Like, what do you have against me keeping my mouth occupied during a performance? I have the choice to stay home and eat whatever the heck I want and drink whenever I want in my pajamas for free on my couch. No snacks or drinks. Like it's a 2009 movie theater and we're all sneaking lifesaver gummies in in our purses. And I'm not talking about like getting wasted at my seat, right? Like that's not what I'm there for. I'm just saying you should have the option. Let's not act like there aren't a bunch of people that are like swaying in their seats in the fourth act because they've been out taking wine like jello shots in sophomore year. So what is it? What is it? Because I can't think of anything besides the fact that it's opera. And so they're saying, well, that's just not what we do. And I think that's very silly. I'm not sorry. Listen, I'm all for keeping things clean. Like historically important things, like, you know, if someone spilled beer on the Mona Lisa, that'd be a shame. But in an opera house, like what is the actual worst thing that could happen if you let people bring a glass of wine to their seats? Let's do better, opera houses. You know, let's just, let's just like take that stick and just, you know, like just, just a little. I think people will like you more. Okay, this one's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough. Something I hate, something I really hate are these bare bones, crazy minimalist productions where there's like barely any set or like the set is really abstract. There's like the barest hint of a costume, you know? Like those very, what does it all mean? Kind of interpretations of opera. This is a whole genre of operatic direction, especially in Europe. These are huge directors, like giant famous opera houses that are doing this. And I have to wonder like, Who's this for? Cause it's not for me. Like I'm going to see Traviata. I want Violetta in a ball gown. I want champagne. I want the curtain to lift and everything is just like dripping with golden paint. That's what I want. And instead I get a white wall and a giant clock for three and a half hours. I don't, I don't like it. And you know what's even worse about this is you don't know what you're signing up for. Like if you're going to see Hamilton, right? They're never gonna put you in the audience and then raise the curtain and the whole stage is just covered in confetti with like one chair off to the side, right? Like people would riot. It's not what they paid for. Like maybe if opera houses just said, okay, we're gonna be doing the music of La Boheme, but just so you know, we've taken the roof off the top of the opera house and also everyone's wearing green. That's the concept. Okay, like I'm, I'm glad, good for you. Have fun with that. I won't be going, 
but thank you for telling me. But they don't do that. Like, why are we all okay with this? I mean, look at this. It just, it looks like a budget crisis. Like, mm, okay guys, we can't actually afford a set and costumes for Turandot, so we're just gonna put all the singers on stilts and call it intellectual. Like, who is this for? Who is this, who is this for? I need us to think about this because it's really important. Let's say you've never seen an opera before and you have been listening to your opera loving friend not shut up about how great it is for years and then you're finally convinced to go see Carmen because you had a brief but very intense crush on Esmeralda when you were 11. Wonderful. But then the curtains open and there's no set. No Spain, no cigarette factory, no jail, not, not one gypsy skirt in sight, just an empty stage covered in sand. This actually happened to me and my partner three months ago in Amsterdam, and I was furious. What is this? A couple of options here. Part of it's that we're being lied to, right? So just tell people what they're buying. That's it. Just be honest. Don't say you're selling Mario Kart and then give me a vintage Hot Wheels car instead. It's not that I don't understand the artistic interpretation behind a Hot Wheels car, it's just that I wanted to play Mario Kart. Just stop lying. Or let us bring alcohol into the theater. That might also help. What opera boils down to is just storytelling. Through music, through singing, through expression, all of it just comes down to storytelling. And that can be done in a lot of different ways. That could be, God help us, Hansel and Gretel in space. And no one should feel bad for trying new things. I'm just one lady with a camera on the internet pretending to be rude about it. But it is not my goal to make the opera world feel bad about trying new stuff, you know? You don't know what's gonna work. It's not like there's a handbook for art. Ultimately, productions should just be things that tell the story that you wanna tell. And if that means putting people in T-Rex costumes, okay, let's not beat ourselves up about it. I'll calm down, you can calm down. We can all experiment together. Having people like me hating on stuff means that there's something happening that has an opinion, that has a voice. And that means there are a lot of people out there who are going to like what you're doing, even if I'm not one of them, and that's okay. And if you're not snacking or drinking while you're watching this video, that's okay too. We're all gonna be okay. There's no right or wrong, is what I'm saying. It's just a story. And at the end of the day, what story did you wanna tell? That's all. Anyways, thanks guys for hanging out. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day or evening or whatever. And uh, I'll see you next time on Scores Unstitched. Bye.